This right here is about to be one of my favorite videos maybe that I've ever created ever. Let's watch this. For the rich young ruler. There's none good. And let me show you God's standard of goodness. It means moral perfection and thought, word, and deed. So let's see if you're a good person. How many lies have you told in your life? Definitely a few. Stolen anything? I have. So you're a lying thief? Uh, I guess so. You still think you're a good person? Probably not. You know, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to bring the knowledge of sin. Most people think, ah, oh, God gave us Ten Commandments as a standard to live by. No, it's a standard we don't live by. When Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he showed us God's standard. The Bible says of the Messiah, he would magnify the law, that's the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and make it honorable. Let me show you what he did. He said, you've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. That's the seventh commandment. And then he said, but I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Did you know that? Uh, I do. Have you looked with lust? Uh, I say I have. Many times? Many times. Have you ever used God's name in vain? I believe so. Do you love your mum? 100%. Did you ever use her name as a cuss word? Never. Never, because you respect her. 100%. You don't respect the God that gave you a mother. You took his holy name and used it in the place of a filth word to express disgust. Godly Jews won't write God's name down because it's so holy, and you've used it in blasphemy. Very serious. So here's the summation, Sincere. This is for you to judge yourself for Judgment Day. Yep. He's, he's doing two interviews at a time, so I'm going to pop back to this one because this is the one I really want to emphasize. Serious sin is in God's eyes. Ever heard the Bible verse, the wages of sin is death? I think I have, but I think I need to be reminded about that. It's a very famous verse, Romans 6.23, and it's saying God is paying you in death for your sins. Like a judge who looks at a criminal who's committed murder, but he keeps saying, I'm a good person, judge. The judge says, I'm going to show you how serious your crime is. I'm giving you the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what you've earned. And Jonathan's sin is so serious to our holy God, He's given you the death sentence. Your death will be evidence to you that God is deadly serious about sin. And you've earned your wages. So on Judgment Day, if God judges you by those ten commandments, will he be innocent or guilty? Most likely guilty. Absolutely guilty. Heaven or hell? Since I'm guilty, most likely hell. You know, the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no blasphemer, no adulterer will inherit God's kingdom. So can you see that you're in big trouble? Yes, sir. So what can you do to get right with God? I confess that Jesus is Lord. He died on the cross for our sins and um, it resurrected three days later. At the moment you're under God's wrath, heading for hell. How can the death of Jesus on the cross help you 2,000 years later? He died for our sins. And what does that mean? Okay. For us to have eternal life with him or a chance at eternal life with him. A chance? Let me share the gospel with you and it'll be a relief to you. Jonathan. So this is a guy who, who's coming into this conversation claiming to be a Christian, by the way, and he doesn't know the gospel. Now, I, in my opinion, I love Ray Comfort. I love this ministry. I could not say enough good things about this ministry. With that being said, I, in my personal opinion, think he's being a little harder on this dude than I would probably be. I would probably be doing more of a stirring him up and loving good works because he has shown me that he really does understand the Bible story. He just isn't giving the answer that Ray specifically wants him to give in this specific context. With that being said, though, Man, do you notice how uncomfortable this conversation has been so far? I, and depending on who you are, maybe there's just like whatever. But maybe if you're like me, it's like, man, it's like, it's like squirm makes me squirm to hear him like really rip through every one of these Ten Commandments. Some people will say he's mean or judgmental or harsh. But this is exactly what Jesus did with the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, 18, 19. Um, somewhere around there. And he was doing it to show his sin is exceedingly sinful. And I have a huge fear, and it's the same fear Ray has, and it's why he does this, that many people who profess the name of Jesus, not only are they not going to be in heaven one day, they don't even know the gospel like at all. Like this dude did actually a fairly okay job of like explaining the gospel. But I talk to most people who proclaim to be Christians their entire life. And you just ask them a one sentence question. What is the gospel? And if I were to ask that to you watching right now, what is the gospel? What is the singular answer that you would give? It should be a very simple, few sentence long answer. It's not, it's something that's so simple a child could understand it. God didn't make this thing complex that only the wise could understand it. Um, just as that professing to be wise, these people became foolish. Uh, they became fools because they started, you know, making these crazy speculations instead of just seeing the truth for what it was. Um, Jesus says in first Corinthians chapter one through three, that he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, that he makes this thing so simple for us. I'm not saying all oh, the Bible is so simple, but I'm talking about the gospel being so simple. And this gentleman is unable to answer the question. And again, I would have been a little bit more gracious with him than this, but 
He's now going to get to hear the gospel probably in its full light for the first time ever in his life. And I want you to see what his, what his reaction is, right? He's just going to go over how you're guilty criminal in God's courtroom and you deserve eternal punishment for the way that you've lived. But God being rich in mercy has sent his son as a savior so that even though that you failed to live by God's moral standard, that he would give you everlasting life because you just put your faith in Jesus, not because of works, but because of faith. And now that you have been saved, you are going to perform these good works. And then, uh, and then this, this is the part that I want you to really see from the conversation. Way of safety. Yeah, you don't want to die. And your motivation is fear. And that fear is your friend, not your enemy, because it's making you put on a parachute. And Jonathan, because I love you, I've tried to put the fear of God in you today. I've tried to make you scared. Hoping you'll see that fear as your friend, not your enemy, because it'll make you serious with God and drive you to the foot of the cross where you'll find everlasting life. Is this making sense? Yes, sir. You're going to think about what we talked about? 100%. Have you ever truly repented with the knowledge of how serious sin is? Because today that law has brought the knowledge of sin, it stirred your conscience. My suspicion is that in the past you've been a little flippant about sin and haven't found a place of genuine sorrow and true repentance, and that's been your problem. Would that be right? I'll say so. Are you sorry for your sins now? 100%. Are you ready to repent and trust in Jesus with all your heart and not your goodness? Yes, sir. Can I pray with you? Yes. Father, I pray for Jonathan. Thank you for his open heart today and the fact that he's listened and that his conscience was tender. I pray this day you'll find a place of true contrition, sorrow for sin, and genuine repentance. Be born again and pass from death to life, all because of your wonderful mercy and your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> you tearing up? Yeah, a little bit. You know what that is? That's contrition. Do you know what contrition is? Yeah. Contrition is a genuine sorrow for your sins. And the Bible says a contrite heart God will not despise. So every tear is precious in God's eyes because it shows the genuineness of your faith in Him and your desire to get right with Him. Do you have a Bible at home? I have an app on my phone. Uh physical Bible now. I'm going to give you a Gospel of John, which is the fourth book in the New Testament, a book I've written called Volatile, which names the nations that God said would attack Israel and would boost your faith in the Word of God. Oh, like how could you not just love that? You know, I'm sitting here, I'm, obviously I'd watched the video already, but I'm criticizing his way of doing it, but um, look, he just brought somebody to Jesus today and I didn't. Um, wow. I... First off, the gospel is so simple and it's so easy to share with people and to not do that, you don't get to experience those moments right there and get to talk to people. And this dude, literally, you just got to watch on camera a person passing from death to life. And like, first off, that should be so exciting for you to see. That should be the highlight of your entire day today, hopefully. Um, but we as Christians have the opportunity and the obligation to be able to share the good news with people, the good news that although being lost in your sin, that God being rich in mercy has sent Jesus so that you do not have to spend an eternity apart from him, but rather in right relation with God, not only in heaven one day, but also right here today now to be in right relation with God, that heaven could be seen on earth today to some extent at least. And sadly, we don't have enough people who are preaching Jesus and they do it based out of fear. They do it because they don't want to be judged or because they don't feel like they know the gospel well enough. And for the people who say, I don't even think I know the gospel well enough to share it, man, please do nothing else with the rest of your day, the rest of your week, month, year, other than knowing this thing, like the back of your hand. He has, uh, Ray Comfort has a, a series called the best, a hell's best kept secret. And you really should check it out. It's really, really good series that goes over exactly how to preach the gospel to people, how to understand the gospel. And, and the point isn't to preach it like he does all the time. I think that he would probably be more pro using that exact same model all the time. I believe that because he uses it every single time of taking somebody through the 10 commandments, showing them their need for Jesus, and then presenting that hope to them. For me, I like to be much more conversational with people. He's also doing something for YouTube. So I'm going to give some grace to that as well, obviously. And it's not like he's sinning with what he's doing, but I like to be far more conversational. Like Jesus was with the woman at the well, where he's having a conversation with her and he brings Jesus into the conversation. I like to do that when I'm with people. You know, I always talk about, you know, where are them at a grocery store or at a restaurant, you know, me and my wife will be out to dinner tonight, or usually we go out to dinner on Friday nights together for a little dates. And it's like, that's an opportunity for me to be Jesus to my waiter or waitress. And just to get in a conversation with them and see where they're at. And the cool thing is you don't usually have to force Jesus into a conversation. Usually all you have to do is have a conversation. 
And if you're a Christian, then your life should be revolving around Jesus all the time, always anyway. So it should be hard to bring Jesus into the conversation. And then now this person gets to have a revelation that they've never had before because of you sharing the goodness of God with them that they have never heard before, they never experienced before. And not only hearing you share the gospel, but seeing Jesus in your life. What do I mean by that? There's a story of a gentleman named Dan Moeller, one of my favorite preachers ever. And he got in a car wreck, really bad car wreck. It totaled his brand new. He just got like a brand new truck. And it completely totaled this truck. And the first thing he did, it was like run to the other car to see if everybody was okay in the other car. And they were, they were fine. And this lady is freaking out, like in shock in the, in the you know, driver's seat. Cause she's like, oh my gosh, this dude's about to kill me. And Dan runs over to her car and was like, you know, oh my gosh, is everybody okay? And she's like, yeah. And she's like, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. Like, it's okay. You know, like the paramedics are coming in case anybody's injured. And like, the most important thing is like, Jesus is still on the throne and he's shown all of us mercy today. And she was like, okay, what do you mean? Everything's okay. I literally just wrecked this man's brand new truck. He's going to be so mad. He's going to be so mad when he like wakes up from his senses, like assuming he was like passed out in the car or something like that. And he starts laughing. He's like, I am the owner of the truck. And she starts wailing. I mean, just like loses it because she's like, thank you so much for not ripping my head off pretty much. And the police officers come to the scene and Dan goes over to them. He's like, guys, everything's okay. I already prayed with everybody. I already got to make sure that they're all right with the Lord and, and everything's okay. Just got to make sure that I, you know, I, I held the 13 year old girl in the back of the car who was terrified and shaking and crying. And, and, you know, she settled down and everything. And the police officer's like, who was the one in the truck? And he was like, I'm the one that was in the truck. And he was like, I have been in a lot of car accidents and I've never seen somebody respond like this in the midst of a car accident. And he was like, I'm sorry that you haven't met another Christian who was looking like Jesus. And he's like, it's a shame because you've probably seen a whole lot of Christians before. Well, anyways, everything was fine. That whole conversation ended and he was doing like a, a prayer, you know, kind of service at a church that was, you know, whatever, three months later, and somebody in the back of the church stood up and they said, did you happen? Like they cut him off in the middle of his like preaching. They said, did you happen to be in a car wreck about three, four months ago in a truck? And he was like, uh, yeah, I did actually. Um, why is that? And they like start having a conversation in the middle of like a, like a teaching service. And he was like, I was the officer who was on the scene when that happened. And he was like, oh, he's like, I do remember you now. And he stopped the whole surface. He said, you know, he said, I want to tell everybody this man that you see preaching right here. He's the real deal. I, I've never gone to church in my entire life. He said, I got touched inappropriately when I was a kid by a man who claimed to be Christian. So I never wanted anything to do with Christ. And I just got, um, I just got uh, diagnosed with cancer. And he said, I saw you guys were doing a healing service of sorts. So I figured I'd stop in worst case scenario, nothing would happen. And I would just leave midway through if I got uncomfortable or whatever. And he said, the only time I've ever been in a church in my entire life is the same guy who I saw that day at the car accident. Who's the only other time I've ever seen a real Christian ever in my life. Yes, you preach the gospel with boldness. Yes, you share with people who Christ is, but also just your testimony of your life lived gets to speak so much to somebody like this that he ended up giving his life to Jesus. I don't remember if he got healed. I don't know if Dan ever shared that part of the story, but this guy ends up getting his salvation all because of this conversation uh, around a car wreck and how you acted and responded like Jesus would act in the midst of a car wreck. Everybody was okay. There was nothing to be freaking out about. Insurance will probably cover it. But at the end of the day, he just knew that Jesus was in control and that this was just a car. At the end of the day, it was just a car. And getting to speak truth, but also represent truth with your life is the reason that you as a Christian are here on the earth. Matthew 16, 24 says, if you do not first deny yourself and pick up your cross daily, you cannot be my disciple. If you fi whoever finds his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it if a man gains the whole world yet loses his soul? I fear that many people who call themselves Christians in America, first off, are deceived and may not even be Christians at all and might be what the Bible calls a false convert. But on top of that, these people are living for nothing but themselves, nothing but their white picket fence lifestyle for them just being all about them and their stuff that they have going on in their life. And they can't even think for a second enough to look outside of themselves to see the other people around who are lost, hopeless, and dying. I, you know, I, I use that phrase a lot, like lost, hopeless, and dying, dying. But like, can we talk about the hope thing for a second? And this idea that you have zero hope if you are not a Christian, that you are going from day to day as molecules and motions, as just atoms and flesh that's just here today, gone tomorrow with no importance, no value, no destiny, no reason for being, no reason that you are alive on this earth. And you're just getting through another day of work. 
That is the maximum experience of a non-Christian's life. And, and maybe if you really have it under control, you have some fun toys to play with on the weekends, like cars and boats and sea doos, ski doos, whatever. That is the height of a non-Christian's life. And you have Christ in you, the hope of glory that wants to be manifested to the outside world, right? The word grace means that God has done a work on your heart inwardly that will be reflected outwardly to the people who are around you. If grace has not done that in your life, I have to wonder whether you have accepted this grace of God that he has given you. Many people, I believe, have not even ha- ha- grabbed this free gift that is available to them because they want half of that gift, but they really want the life that they're living right now. They really want the fun that they're living in right now. And this guy that we just saw this interview for, he's a prime example of somebody who believes in the Bible story, may even go to church at times, but isn't living like Jesus has called him to live. And Ray had called him to live to a higher standard that Christ had paid a price for us to live. And my question for you is, are you doing that? Are you living to that standard that Christ has called you to live? I'm not saying, are you living perfect? I'm not saying, do you have everything figured out? But the things that Jesus has commanded us to do, where he says, the things that I have done, you will do these things also, if you believe. Are you doing these kinds of things that Jesus says? Jesus says in, in John 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That we will bear good fruits if we are in Christ. And are you bearing those good fruits? I'm not saying these things to scare you, but more so to wake you up to saying, whoa, you know, am I really doing this Christian walk thing the right way, the way that God's called me to? And if not, how can I get ready today to make a difference? Step one that you can do, read the Bible every single day without fail. If you do not do it, you should be reading every single day. Whether you think that you understand it, whether it's fun or encouraging for you, whether you're a busy person or not a busy person, guys, everybody's a busy person if you have red blood in your veins. So no, you just start reading and don't stop. Chapter a day keeps the devil away. Just kidding. But read the Bible every day. Start in the New Testament, start in the book of Matthew and just keep going. First thing is read. Second is be in regular fellowship with other believers who can encourage, convict, and challenge you. So this doesn't mean go to church on Sundays. Go to church on Sundays. I don't mind that. But I'm just saying every week, you should be regularly fellowshipping with other people who can encourage and challenge you. You're not just watching The Walking Dead together. You're not just playing video games together. You're actually growing in grace together. You guys are learning about looking more like Jesus every single day together, every single day. That's the second thing that you should be doing. And then thirdly, do things outwardly that shows the rest of the world that you're a Christian. Matthew 5 says, let your light so shine before men so they can see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. You as a Christian need to be having these good works, not because they save you, but because Jesus commanded you to have them. That simple. So are you preaching Jesus to people? Are you serving people? Are you meeting the needs of the lost? Are you helping people who have needs in their life? If you're not doing any of these things, helping the widow and the orphan and visiting people in prison and clothing the naked, if you're not doing these things and you are not doing the things that Jesus has commanded, if you start implementing these things and spend time with Jesus and see as he transforms your life through your prayer, intimacy and prayer, or excuse me, and reading time with him, And then you live out that life out of the abundance overflow from your heart from this time that you've been alone with the Lord, you will see as everything starts to change in your life. If you want more deep dive into this stuff, click this video over here and I will chat with you all in the next one.